So welcome to the 2019 Top 18 Careers Industry Trends presented by Career Thought Leaders. And this comes out of our Career Jam, where each year we get together thought leaders in the industry who want to foreshadow the trends, think about trends, talk about what's going on in the industry and how we are responding to it as career service providers. I'm the CEO of Career Thought Leaders, Marie Zimanoff, and we had more than 80 professionals get together to come up with this information. So thank you to all of our facilitators and all of our participants who made this information possible and sharing it with you is my pleasure, but it came from them. Again, in the follow-up email to this webinar, you will get the link to our white paper, which we're releasing with the details of all of this information, as well as the links that give you the detail and the data behind some of the information that we're sharing. Some of the information that we're sharing is simply our, our thought leaders, their perceptions, their observations in the market, and some of it is data that it comes from sources who've done some research in these areas. So we're excited to share all this detail with you. And again, you'll get the white paper link in your follow-up email, the recording to this webinar, and the opportunity to submit your name if you'd like a certificate for attending this webinar live. We have a lot of you on the call and thank you for using the chat to say hello and share the area of career services that you're working in. Career thought leaders, our mission is to advance and professionalize the careers industry so that we can improve not only our work as career development professionals, but also the work of all of our clients. And we're doing this worldwide. It's been an exciting year for career thought leaders. In 2018, we served more than 1,000 career service professionals in 37 countries with more than 3,300 networking and education hours. So we've got all of you engaged from all over the globe and giving us feedback so that we can provide trends, training, and connections to you. And we are just excited to have so many of you joining us and coming to our events virtually and in person. You've probably seen this graphic going around. These are the six trends that we based our Career Jam on this year, looking at how these six trends are really impacting the careers industry. So this was a little bit of a shift for us in Career Jam. In the past, we've gotten together and talked about transitions in our industry content areas. So what's going on in resumes? What's going on in job search? And this year, we decided to take a little bit different approach and look at how these outside forces were really impacting our work as career professionals. So how are new generations in the workplace, gig economy, education changes, artificial intelligence and its insurgence into recruiting, hiring, and our daily work, social, social branding, social recruiting, and storytelling. And we took a look at how each of those mega trends, if you will, macro trends, were impacting the careers industry. So the first one, generations in the workplace, had some interesting trends come up here. And really the first one that came out from a lot of our groups was that boomers are persisting in the workplace. Boomers are really staying around. They want to work. They want to work differently and they want to work flexibly. And we are helping them figure out how to do that, negotiate with their employers to do that, and decide how they're going to do what they want to do while still perhaps making a little bit money and feeling like they're contributing in a meaningful way. And Louise Kersmark is one of our scribes for the Boston event. And Louise, you wanted to share a little bit about what your group discussed in terms of this idea with Boomer Persistence. Thanks, Marie. I was just looking at my notes and trying to remember what what fascinating point I was going to make on that topic and now I have absolutely no idea so I will just throw out something in terms of what we were talking about having to do with um, with generations in the workforce and that had to do with the fact that as we look at how work the workforce is made up the concept of older and younger workforce being a diverse workforce is not necessarily the trend that we are seeing or that we want to see. It is that we want to have a diversity of experience in the workforce. So people who have different levels of experience, different ages, different specialties, different communication styles, the more diverse a workplace is, including boomer people, um, is going to make it a stronger workforce 
place. And there have been studies that have shown that, that when we actually include um, more diverse workforce, we have a better performing organization. So as I said, I think I had another important point. And if I think of it, I will uh, chime in, but that's the only thing that I could think of at the moment. Good. Yeah, that, that diversity is important. And we see that that diversity is coming, right? So this is Statistica's data by 2020, the percentage of people in the world, this is the global workforce, and very interesting, Gen Z, they're at the far right, coming on strong really fast. So this is a generation that was born in most definitions. And um, is graduating from college the last few years. So they're 26 and under. So you have them entering the workforce right now. Some generation definitions have them a little bit younger, but the most common ones have them as 26, 27 and under following the, those millennials. And they are coming into the workforce strong. Interestingly, this data shows only 6% of the workforce being boomers. And the anecdotal data from our groups would, would share that that is not necessarily accurate. So I have to dig a little bit deeper into these numbers and see what they're defining in, in terms of the workforce. But you can see the diversity in terms of generations coming on strong here. And that means for us as career professionals, we need to adapt what we're doing. So our millennials are in leadership roles. Um, this statistic was from 2016, 2017, that 20% 20 of millennials are in leadership roles. Most of us have this because we work with them, but they're 37, right? The older group of millennials is, is up to 37. They're not youngsters, they're in leadership roles and they need our help in that. They also want to consume career coaching, career professional help differently. They want us to be on demand, to be online. And I saw a great article by JT O'Donnell talking about how they don't want us to be their parents. They don't want that preachy, this is the best for you kind of approach. They really need us to be a coach. And they, they are seeking out coaching. Um, article by uh, Harvard Business Review talking about how 50% more millennials want or that 50 millennials want feedback 50% more often than other age groups. So millennials need that feedback much more than X or boomers. And they're really looking for that feedback from a boss as a coach, but also um, they're, they're seeking out coaches for that coaching. And Louise, I know you had a thought around how we need to adapt to meet their needs as well. Yes, I did. And actually it's fascinating to think about how people buy services. And it's, this translates to everything from takeout to online shopping to career services. So people are so much more comfortable purchasing online, really sight unseen, than they ever have been. And in fact, particularly the younger generations, they expect to be able to make a purchase of something online. So they want to see their options. They want to be able to flip through and sort through what they might purchase, make a purchase, and then have that service delivered you know, instantaneously or overnight or whatever the expectation is for that. So as we think about career professionals, how we are offering services, making that instantaneous online purchase, I mean, it used to be that you know, years ago, you, people would never purchase something online without having that conversation and, and it, oftentimes an in-person meeting. And that has totally flipped. So the more uh, of online buying options we can offer if we are in, in private practice and the more online instant delivery options we can offer in any setting, I think the more we're going to engage with these younger clients who are just, they just have that expectation. So that's a, a shift for us. Uh, to meet the need and the expectation that we are seeing in this area of the market and so many others. Yeah, it's very interesting. The buying habits as well as the delivery and how they want to interact with that and how that changes how we market our services, whether we're at a university, a workforce center, or a uh, independent practice, we're all marketing our services, trying to get people to engage, right? And And how we do that needs to be something that can engage them online, whether it's video, other ways that they can check us out online and make that pur purchase without having to speak with us. Right, and, and Marie, Ruth had a comment in the comments about potential clients want an immediate reaction. So maybe that feeds into, we don't have to be instantly available to provide an hour of career coaching. 
or turn out a resume in a day, but we need to respond to them, maybe give them an assignment, give them something to look at or read or do while they're you know, waiting for the process to begin so that they're getting that instant um, feedback and validation of the purchase that they just made or yes. the, the appointment that they are trying to make if they're not, in, you know, if it's not a purchase environment. Right. And some of the new technology could help us do that with chat bots and all other things that we have available to us today. Then this is one of the ideas that kind of comes back to what you were just talking about, Louise, in terms of we're kind of over the generations conversation and perhaps because we've got four generations in the workplace now, there's much more important ways that we're talking about diversity and with the age bias and racial issues that are going on, especially in the US and immigration issues that are happening across the world. People are talking more about diversity in a lot of different ways and, and perhaps generations isn't the most important kind of diversity anymore. The launch of Gen Z into the workplace had a little fervor around it in 2017, a little bit 2018, and maybe now we're moving forward to talking about it in different ways. And our London group was really talking about how the workplace is talking about how everyone wants to be happy at work, right? There was this big fuss about how millennials wanted meaning or boomers wanted meaning. Well, guess what? Everyone's, everyone wants meaning. So different ways of defining how we look at happiness in the workplace and diversity in the workplace, other than what generations need to be happy or need to be in considered a diverse workplace. And so our second one then, moving into talking about the gig economy. Gig economy is a challenging concept because there are so many different ways that people talk about this. So you have, are you supplementally in the gig world? Like, so you've got a full-time job, but you also drive for Uber. That's this 14% here in the light green. Are you a primary independent worker? That's 13% of the US, um, and this is a US, world work, uh, US workplace. Then you'll read some data that says, oh, by 2020, which, is next year now, by 2020, 40% of the workforce is gonna be a gig economy. Well, this data would say that we're probably not gonna hit that if you define the gig economy as being primary independent. If you combine it as those two together, primary and supplemental, we're almost close to 30, so getting to 40 by 2020, maybe, I don't know. Um, so some people will say, oh, the gig economy is not as big as you think it is. And some people say, oh, it's huge. It depends a lot on how you're defining it and what you're talking about in terms of the gig economy. So gig economy in general, side hustles plus people who are doing work independently as their own gig, as their full-time gig, they are demanding more in terms of co-ops for insurance, for professional affiliation, to have colleagues, and co-working. Co-working space is blowing up, right? Independent ones, WeWork, which is kind of a huge one that's come out, uh, started in Denver, I think. And there's these kind of co-ops that are taking place, both for, you know, let's get together and not be isolated, and share some of those buying powers that we have as an organization. And our attendees at Career Jam saw this happening, saw more people participating in them. And of course, even in our own industry, we're seeing an uptick in people wanting to join events like this, to get together, to see what's going on, to have an opportunity to chat and to talk. And, and that's been exciting for us as well to have more of you participating in these types of events. Side hustles are growing, but people still don't like them when you apply for traditional positions. So 75% of millennials think that job hopping is okay. However, 16% on the far right here, 16% of companies with 1,000 plus employees are okay hiring someone that they consider a job hopper. 37% of people have a side hustle, and yet many people are trying to figure out, do I tell my employer? How do I tell my employer? Do I hide it from them? How do I brand myself and work that into my story so that it doesn't get in my way, but it is something that I'm doing? So more people are doing this, but it's not necessarily easy for people to figure out how to put it together, which has created this trend and opportunity for us as career professionals. These folks need help. They need help telling their story. They need help putting the pieces together. They need to understand how to 
appeal to their audience, depending on who their audience is. If they're applying as a 1099, showing all of those gigs and projects and their ability to move between them might be a positive. If they're applying to that full-time job, how do they build their case for that full-time job so that they can look like what the employer expects for that type of position? Did have a few attendees saying that it is a little bit easier now for job hoppers and side hustlers to get into a full-time position. Obviously, with the workforce and the low, low unemployment, that's not too surprising. And hopefully that trend will continue as more millennials who are okay with job hopping get into those leadership roles. Hopefully they stay okay with job hopping and hiring fellow job hoppers. Uh, but these folks need us, and this is a big part of what folks in our industry are doing, helping put the pieces together as people want to move from one gig to the other, or from one gig to a full-time job, or perhaps from that full-time job back into gigging, side hustling, or, or some other kind of freelance type of work. So Ruth is sharing that precariousness of work is a big topic in the UK because of the rise of the gig economy, but also because of the increasing disruption, more layoffs, more shifts, political disruption, um, right? Even our federal government had in the US had the big late, um, furlough and people who had never thought that their, un that their employment was at risk started to feel a little bit of an uneasiness about just because I'm a federal employee doesn't mean that I'm, uh, I'm not at risk to instability. And Brexit, of course, in the UK and political shifts in the US. <laughs> um, back and forth, a little bit difficult for those of us who are, are in, in many countries in the world right now. So the next topic was education. And education shifts going on in the industry itself and in how education is delivered, education shifts going on in terms of how businesses want to consume educated talent, and education uh, shifts going on in terms of how those of us who are getting education want to get that education. So big companies are going on record saying that skills are more important than than education. So IBM, Apple, Google, trying to get out of this rut of you have to have a degree to get this job. And this is something that especially job seekers want to glam onto, right? That I don't need a degree. I, I can get this job without a degree, but that's really not what they're saying. What they're saying is that you don't need perhaps a bachelor of science or a master's, but you still need training. And if I see like some confusion going on in the marketplace around this. It's not that all you need is a high school education. It's that you don't perhaps need a bachelor's or a master's now for positions where you used to need a bachelor's or master's. And that shift and, and how we help our clients through this conversation, I think is tricky. I know it's tricky because what we saw in the last recession and the recovery from that recession. So this is from 2010 to 2016 in the recovery from the, the U.S. recession, and this is U.S. only data, that those with some college or an associate's degree, with bachelor's degree, and with master's degree recovered much better than those with high school or less. Now what you don't see in here are the intricacies, especially in this some college or associate's degrees, around trades, around training, around technical skills. So yes, we may not need a bachelor's degree today. That doesn't mean that we can just go from high school to a job and think that we're going to have long-term employability. And how do we help our clients develop a mindset of long-term learning, long-term employability, where they're looking at their industry and their future positions, really thinking, what is the training or education that I need to get there? And how can I make sure I don't get caught? Like so many of my clients did in 2009 and 2010, working with so many clients who didn't have bachelor's degrees that could not find work. Even though they had 20 or 30 years of experience, they couldn't find work because they didn't have that degree. Do I think that that's ridiculous? Yes, and that's reality. I don't want people to get stuck in 
the dissonance here as we're shifting and perhaps the shift will continue and that's great if we continue to shift away from degrees but in the middle will people get caught because they don't get what they need along the way and as career professionals how can we help them read the market stay in tune with the market continue to learn so that they don't get stuck without a degree when the market changes its mind and says now we have a lot of unemployed people and we can be picky again and make sure that you have that degree apprenticeships certifications micro learning taking off this online piece that louise was just talking about in terms of how people want to consume not just their learning or not just their purchases but also their learning so massive online courses micro learning apprenticeships boot camps especially in the tech world you know coding coding camp blooming going out of control these are a lot private programs a lot of them are privately held private institutions where people are making money off of these boot camps which is fine right because they're getting people employed but if we're thinking about that in terms of will they come and go when they aren't making any money when they aren't needed anymore perhaps and the university is starting to pick up some of the slack there which we'll talk about in a second and then policy really driving some workforce initiatives uh, certification initiatives and especially apprenticeship initiatives in the US the UK and Australia and perhaps other countries that didn't share their their information with us so we're seeing that not only are there private entities seeing that there's an opportunity here, but there's also big government entities seeing that there's a need to fill this gap in how people are consuming education and how we can make sure we have the workforce that we need, which may not require a university degree, which may be those apprenticeships, those trades, people that we need in those roles. Profession or a traditional higher education is seeing this challenge. How do we meet this need? How do we make sure we're relevant, that we're offering degrees that are relevant, where people can get jobs, where there's accessible degrees and training, where it doesn't take so much time to get the training that you need? And universities are really stepping up to the plate. Some of our uh, participants shared programs that are going on at MIT, at universities in, in Canada, at universities in the US, where they are innovating. They're thinking about how they can make an impact and bringing back career and technical education, both at the university or community college level, as well as at the, the K through 12, our local high school just launched another big career and technical education program. And it's, you know, interesting to watch the reactions because people are like, oh, yeah, um, you know, this always has existed, but now they're trying to make it cool, right? They're trying to make it attractive because what we find the problem is here is not only a lack of offerings in this area, but also a lack of interest, especially in the U.S., uh, parents if you are on the line, parents, having a challenge thinking about our kids not going to a four-year program. Is our kid going to be successful if they go to trade school and make tons of money as a plumber, as a mechanic? So we've got a mindset shift to make in the U.S. And interestingly, Micah, our board member in Spain, said the kind of opposite is going on in Germany, where Germany has always been very strong in the apprenticeships and getting people through these programs having a lot of trades people go through these programs and now actually having the reverse where they're starting to get away from that and it's not cool anymore to be in an apprenticeship now they want to go to these four-year schools and and get the same kind of education maybe a little bit of backslide there so perception and how we portray these careers how we think about these careers and really how we as parents and educators educate people about these careers being so important to how we make this shift and have the pro professionals that we need who are successful and stable even as we see the rise of artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence is never going to come in and fix your plumbing or maybe is going to help be the mechanic in your car but they aren't going to be able to do it for themselves for a really long time Artificial intelligence is a tricky term for folks. 
because it incorporates so much. And in fact, when I first put the topic of artificial intelligence into our materials, I said artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I started doing a little bit more digging and turns out here you see machine learning at the top right as part of kind of this global big definition of artificial intelligence. And when we think about all these different ways that artificial intelligence is coming into our workplace, every type of work. It's coming into recruiting and hiring and HR functions throughout the employee life cycle. How do we interact with this? How do we use it? And how do we as coaches embrace this? We're teaching our clients to embrace it. And yet it's still a challenge for us. We think, oh, artificial intelligence could never do the coaching that I do, right? Artificial intelligence could never do it. And yet we see artificial intelligence coaching programs coming online and they're doing good work for people. What we have to think about is where do we come alongside that technology? Because it's not us versus it. It's not us versus the technology. It's how do we show our skills, our differentiation, our additional value, to the technology. And if I'm in a pitch to a big company who already has an artificial technology coaching system, what do I add on top of it? What are the problems and the issues and the challenges of people that they might put through a program but then need something more, then need additional support, then need help doing X, Y, or Z? That that's what I bring as the coach in addition to this great system that you have. Not saying it can't do what I can do, but here's what it does and here's the value that it does and here's how much it offers. And then this is where the coach takes you. This is where the individual, independent, one-on-one -on -one coach comes in alongside that technology and adds value. Very important for us to start using that language, thinking that way, instead of the us versus them or it can never do what I do. It, it maybe can do some of what we do and how are we going to bring our world along with it. Where we're seeing it in the hiring world, and this kind of blew up in our discussions, I saw it in every single group, video interviewing. It's interesting because in 2017, some articles came out saying that video interviewing was waning, less people were using it. Then in 2018, you see this huge amount of data around how many companies are using it. In fact, there was one report that 80% of companies with 10,000 employees or more 80% of 10,000 employees or more are using video interviewing to have the opportunity to get better candidates. And they are using the software to try to get better candidates. Some other data I saw was you know, around 40, somewhere between 30 and 50% of companies overall using video interviewing. 33% of companies using AI in their hiring process somewhere. And, you know, as coaches, we start to think, and I see some asking here about, you know, what does AI do to relate to human feelings? It's not that AI is necessarily ready to relate to human feelings, and they think it'll be a long time until it can do that. But there are some AI coaching things that that can happen. And the um, AI coaching platforms that you'll see aren't necessarily dealing with issues of human feeling. They're dealing with choice, how do people explore careers? How do they take the output from an assessment and match it with careers? They're doing some of that base level work, if you will. And so then we as career professionals come in and say, yes, that's great. And some people can do it with just that, just like some people could do it with just a book, right? They can read a book and they can make a career change all on their own. Great for them. Some people need help. They get stuck. They have hit a hard spot. They do have some emotional challenges with making that transition, most people, but not all, right? Some people can just do it based on that, that internal platform that they're delivering through the AI, which matches skill sets to positions in the organization. It says, you know, if these are the skills you want to use, these are the positions in the organization that will be a good fit for your skills. That's the part of coaching that they're using the AI to do. And then Ruth is sharing that a Swedish company is developing a robot interviewer that is to overcome recruiter bias. And I think this is an important area for us to think about. When we talk about bias with video, there are lots of ways that video could create bias. So there's an article on how video was creating gender bias and the AI systems weren't scoring women as high as men. 
because guess what? A lot of programmers are men. So there was some internal bias built into the AI. You're going to have those issues because the technology is built by humans. And then talking about socioeconomic status. So if someone doesn't have the technology and all they have is their cell phone, they might not show up as good as someone that has the setup and has a great backdrop and has a microphone, has a camera, right? So are you creating some bias around socioeconomic status? And then of course with technology, are you really getting a person or are you seeing who's the best performer on video? However, most of the AI outcomes that they're aiming for are to reduce bias. So video can now score your personality. And some people that scares, they say, oh, I don't want a video scoring my personality. But humans are scoring your personality and research has shown that they're horrible at it. And Unilever, one of the biggest users of Higher View, which is one of the main interview video systems, video interview systems, Higher View, they found that they are actually doing better hiring with the AI video than with humans because humans have a lot more bias than we like to admit. And we choose based on emotion. We buy based on emotion. We choose based on emotion, which is really not a great decision maker. So they're trying to use video for good, not for evil. And if we can help our clients understand that and put the pieces together, they're going to be a lot more happy when they see a video interview. How can we help them overcome the fear? And um, Louise, oh no, Kimberly wanted to share on this topic, but I haven't seen her in here. So we'll just keep moving. So ATS and AI are working together. ATS being the applicant tracking systems that sift through resumes. So they are starting to use machine learning to better sift through the resumes. JobScan came out with an article about a year ago, 98% of Fortune 500 companies are using ATS. They want to make it better. So just like video interviewing, they don't want it to eliminate the wrong candidate. They want it to get the right candidate without having to pay a person to go through all the resumes, right? And guess what? Those lower level people that go through resumes, pretty much doing the same thing that ATS would do anyways. So they are using machine learning to better read the resume. So the machine is learning which candidates are best based on the human feedback to the resumes that the system spits out. They're really trying to make it better. There's a lot of fear and a lot of misinformation around applicant tracking systems. People talking about, you know, how you don't get through and some of that is true. A lot of that may not be as true as you think it is. Most of the things I hear people saying in terms of formatting and this doesn't go through and this is causing issues, a lot of that is false. If we are writing from a good, strong base of this is our client's focus, they're targeted, they understand the job needs of their employer, they've looked at job descriptions and understand the words that match up to those needs, we are going to be able to make those connections fairly easily and we need to be informed about applicant tracking systems. We also need to consume information about applicant tracking systems carefully. There's a lot of people out there trying to prey on this fear and you know, oh, if you pay us this much money, we'll make sure your resume gets through applicant tracking systems. Some of those are legit, some of them are not. We need to be careful consumers of this information and really understand what is important how we get through a system, and how we network around it, which still makes a huge impact. I have a client just got a job because he had referrals, right? Yes, he went and he applied online, but he went and had those people from the company go and submit a referral for him. That's how companies want to hire. Yes, the, knowing, through how to, knowing how to get through applicant tracking systems is important, and, and we've got to help our job seekers not be afraid of that so that they aren't applying not blame the ATS for why they aren't getting chosen. Sometimes it's that they're applying for the wrong jobs, they're not qualified, right? And of course an applicant tracking system is gonna kick them out when they're not qualified. And sometimes it's because the internal process is that they look at referrals first. The company that this hire, person got hired at, they look at internal people only first, then they look at referrals only second. And if they don't get any candidates from either of those two hiring groups, then they look at an applicant tracking system. So it's very possible there's a handful of people who applied online to this position and said, oh, I was a perfect match for this job. There's something wrong with my resume. I didn't get through the applicant tracking system. 
no, you weren't referred, so you didn't get to interview because that's how this company hiring process works. There's a lot going on behind the scenes that could be the reason the client's not getting an interview. We have to be careful to not blame the applicant tracking system first. The future favors tech and people skills and both. So a lot of fear here around, oh, technology is going to wipe out all of these jobs. If you look at the data, there's a lot, a lot of inconsistencies here. There are good data sources that say 14% of jobs are going to be replaced in the next 20 years globally because of technology. Then there's other sources that say 50% of this, 50% of jobs are going to be replaced globally. Well, that number is huge and scary. But 14% is not very huge or scary, right? 14% is probably pretty close to a normal churn in jobs being replaced by other jobs. And there's data from PricewaterhouseCoopers that technology may create even more jobs than it replaces. So it's not about all these jobs are going to go away. It's that jobs are changing. Jobs are changing all the time and jobs are going to continue to change in the future. And we need the technology skills to be able to run the technology, to be able to own the technology, to be the person that is leading that technology, not the person who's afraid of it, doesn't understand how to use it, or is saying it can never do what I do. And we need the people skills to bring those extra that the technology can't, right? Micah went to a, a symposium in Spain talking about technology and AI is not that close to being able to mimic human emotion. Our people skills are gonna be important. Our creativity, our innovation, our customer service. You'll even see the anti-trend coming along with the AI already. So there are companies rolling out that, ooh, we have chatbots, and that's great because you can interact with this chatbot right away. Then you'll see anti-trend commercials from other organizations saying, you'll get a real person. You aren't going to get a chatbot when you come to us. People are going to build up their people skills, build up their people connection, because it's gonna be a differentiator in the tech world. And our clients can do the same. And they still have to know how to use the technology and own the technology and run the technology, along with being great at their people skills. Louise, I, you had something to add around applicant tracking systems. I did. I had two thoughts on that. The first is uh, somewhat of a concern, but hopefully if companies are looking at uh, the results of their, of their applicant tracking system screening process, it, it can mitigate. But artificial intelligence rewards human behavior so that it will better respond and predict what you're going to do next based on what you've done in the past. So if companies that are, that are slowly integrating artificial intelligence into the selection process if, if they are using, let's say, biased responses, if they always choose homogeneous candidates, um, then the artificial intelligence system will learn to reward those kinds of candidates. So there is the, there is the um, possibility of bias. As you mentioned earlier, all, you know, all men were, were building, so therefore there's a male bias. So the, I think that companies do need to be aware of the possibility for bias, even if they've introduced these systems systems in an attempt to eliminate it, they have to monitor and make sure that that is actually happening and is not rewarding the wrong kinds of activities. Um, and the other point that our group came up with, which, I, which was a really fascinating point and a fantastic idea for some entrepreneurial thinker out there, is that artificial intelligence and many things in our world now are rewarding the gamification. So in other words, you do something, you get a reward. You do it again, you get another reward. People find it fun. It can reward your diet behavior, exercise routine. It can reward the steps in the application process. So there's lots of ways that the, the artificial intelligence supported gamification is a trend. I think if someone came up with a, an app or some other service that rewards job seekers from taking all the right steps in their job search 
so that it rewards them for networking. It rewards them for going around the, the applicant tracking system to get to a real person. It rewards them for getting a referral. I think that would be not only fun and popular, but it would be so successful for the people who do it and very profitable for the entrepreneur who comes up with it. So I offer that in case there are any tech geniuses out there who can come up with that app. But you know, let's think about how can we reward our candidates for doing the right things um, beyond the reward of the of the results of what they're doing, but is there some fun way that we can some way we can make it more fun? Because job search is not that much fun. Yeah, well, and we do have a few um, a few colleagues who have systems. So Rhonda, I'm not going to remember her name, but she's on the East Coast and she's done some gamification of the process, and she sells a, a system where people can go in and enter the activity, and they they have a process to build a design based on their activity. That's kind of the reward is that they're building this design. And there's also a lot of gamification going on in other ways. Um, oh, Ruth Feller, or Rich, Rich Feller is also doing some work in gamification of the career process in person, not online. And so there's, there's people doing it and definitely some opportunity for more people to do it. Just speak to the EEO compliance. So I think this is a response to my saying that the company this client got hired at interviews internally, then they interview referrals, then they interview external. If that is their process and they follow that process every single time, it's going to fit with the EEO compliance. They do not have to interview everyone. Each company sets up their own process. And as long as they follow it every time without deviating, they're going to fit into their EEO compliance um, because they're offering, offering equal opportunity to every person in that exact same process. So always internal only, referrals only, then external. If they do that every time, it's, gonna, it's going to fit into uh, compliance, even though it's not giving everybody a chance. Um, all right, good. And then someone was asking about... LinkedIn videos. So people did talk about video resumes and kind of that there was a lot of talk about them three or four years ago and then the, they died because no one wants to watch a video resume. So video is coming back in some ways on LinkedIn and it'll be interesting to see where it goes. The video resume idea kind of blows up the whole idea of bias and compliance. Um, however, with AI scoring those resume videos, we may see them come back because then there's not going to be a viewer bias to that video resume anymore. The, the AI could just score the video resume, which some people would say would then creates other bias. What we are seeing is video interviewing and video screening because the interviewer gives you the questions they want you to answer and then you answer them versus a video resume kind of being all over the place and what will I get from it and is it going to give me all the information I need? Maybe, maybe not. Is it worth my time? Most of what we're seeing is no, not yet. And so people aren't doing it. People are doing video in lots of other ways, which goes more into this social branding and social sourcing conversation because video right now is more about building your brand than having a video resume. So the data that we shared last year in our report last year, I just wanted to remind us of this. This is a career builder study in 2017 that 70% using social to screen, 54% decided not to hire based on something they found, and 69% using a search engine, Google, Yahoo, to do that search rather than just looking on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever they're using. So people are doing social screening and social screening is getting more elaborate and, and using AI and doing it in different ways. One of the different ways we're seeing people do it is that you've actually seen a decrease of recruiters on LinkedIn from 2017 to 2018. You saw a decrease of recruiters on LinkedIn and an increase of recruiters on Facebook. LinkedIn's doing some things to try to shift this again and we're seeing a lot of changes because of that. We'll see if it works. But link, uh, recruiters got fed up with LinkedIn and all of their changes and pay, pay, pay to get everything. And they started to leave. They started to try Facebook and they started to try Instagram. Down here at the bottom, 25% of recruiters trying Instagram, 35% if they're millennial recruiters, and 63% if they're in technology companies. So they are trying different social platforms. It's not just about LinkedIn. There are many other ways that our clients have opportunity to connect to recruiters if they're open to using some of these other platforms. 
authenticity and engagement. So social screening is using AI, which means that it's going through and scoring your social engagement and deciding what your personality traits are. So not just your profiles, but your comments, your posts. It is saying overall, the, these posts tell me this about Marie. And this is a good thing for our clients because this could show an authentic brand of them, a more general picture of them, rather than just do they have experience in this industry or not. So if they're passionate about the cycling industry, they might have a company that finds them and recruits them, even though they're not in the cycling industry. This could open up doors for our clients. Yes, there's some scary things. Most of those have to do with our clients' scary actions on social media that we can help them control. So data that I removed from the data that I just showed you was that if you do not have social presence, you are not very likely to get an interview. I don't remember the data, but it was in the 50s somewhere in the 50% range of employers who've decided not to hire someone or not to interview someone because they do not have a social presence. So not having a social presence, depending on the industry, isn't the solution. People expect you to be online. They expect you to be more accessible than ever. So not just professional, but also personal and really connecting with the other person. The challenge is that there's a more fear and distrust around social media, people leaving Facebook because of the Facebook issues. Um, although most of those people are going to Instagram and guess what? Instagram's ran by Facebook. Um, so there, there's challenge for us because we know social is important. We know that it can be positive for our client to build a, a, a brand and it can be an opportunity for them to be found in a different way than they could ever be found before. And they have viable or credible concerns that we have to help them mitigate. What are they going to share? How can they control their privacy while still having an online brand? These are all the situations that we have an opportunity to help people go through. And that it doesn't have to be an either or, it's a management. How are you going to manage this? How are you going to do this in a way that works for you and works for employers to find you and to stay connected with you? And this goes right into our last topic, which was storytelling. Professionals are using more portfolios, both online and in person portfolios in interviews to connect with employers. And this is one way that they're taking control of that social media online presence issue. We saw these go away maybe three or four years ago and now they have this resurgence because you can control what's out there about you a little bit more if you have your own online portfolio or online website instead of a just having your social media profiles up there that gives them more control. So their profile could be a little bit less robust if they're worried about security issues and they could have their own online website where people can find them that is something they control what goes in there and what goes to the search engines. And that was a big topic that a lot of people talked about. And then authentic stories win the day. And we're trying to find a balance here, right? I see on LinkedIn people sharing really personal things and kind of getting slapped by other people saying that's a Facebook thing, not a LinkedIn thing. We're trying to navigate these murky waters of no one wants that pro professional walled fake face anymore. No one wants that fake face. And yet if we push it too far, depending on the medium, we might not it might not work either so we're we're navigating this very murky space of you need to be authentic you need to engage with people and yet there's a limit depending on the medium and how you tell that story in terms of does it matter to the audience and does it connect with the platform that you're on and very strong points made here both in our input from the participants as well as in an article that i just read on talking about this issue that yes we want a story but in the words of Deb Dib make me care and make me care fast because I don't have all day I'm not going to watch your video unless you catch me in the first few seconds I'm not going to read your story unless it connects with me and it's appropriate for the audience and appropriate for the platform that you're writing it on so we've got to tell a story that matters that connects we've got to understand our clients 
before telling our story. Um, Ryan Roten is going to give a presentation on this at the CTL conference for us in terms of marketing our services, that how we tell our story can really disengage our audience or engage them and say, yes, you know, come in, I invite you in, you're part of my story. And we have to understand how to help our clients do that and tell their story in a way that makes sense for their audience. And this might mean that more formal stories for some audiences and more informal stories for other audiences, not necessarily the client, but their audience. And Louise, I know you had something that you wanted to say here as well. I did, and just really piggybacking on what you've said, and I, I, you know, I'll be doing a session on this at the upcoming um, conference, so I'm excited to talk about that. I think one of the things that struck me as I was working on my program and, and reviewing what we had talked about in our, in our session for Career Jam was, it is so important for us to understand, for people in job search, our clients to understand that they're telling a story not to tell a story. They're telling a story to support a point or to indicate some value or to connect with the audience. The story has to have a purpose because we, we sometimes or we can go overboard with this concept of oh, storytelling, storytelling, tell your story, great stuff, but we cannot lose sight of the underlying purpose and, as you said, Marie, the needs of the audience. Why will they care about this? Because inherently, yes, stories are interesting, but they, for busy people, they need to be interesting with a purpose. And I love that. I think you shared this in a recent uh, newsletter, Marie, about how people listen. And it was a very interesting split in this article. There was 55% prefer to be persuaded by stories and 45% prefer to be persuaded by facts. So it's almost a 50-50 split. So we need to be very careful in how we're coaching clients to tell their stories, what their stories contain, and always keep them focused on why they're telling the story and honestly getting to the point um, and not rambling all over the place for the sake of a story. So it's kind of a delicate balance because the story is powerful, but it must have a purpose. Right, and we've got to know our audience. I was working with a, a leadership client once who had to give a presentation to the, their CFO, and she was in the helping profession. She was in the area of uh, diversity within the organization, so HR-ish, and she had all these great stories she wanted to tell, and I said, well, what's important to him? She said, oh, he's numbers. I said, well, let's get some numbers. Let's get some numbers and put those numbers at the beginning, the engagement, the retention, you know, let's talk numbers with him, talk dollars, talk numbers. And then you can have some of your stories at the end, because I do think that everyone buys on emotion. Well, we know, we know everyone buys on emotion. There are just some people that want the facts first, and then they'll buy on emotion. And if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs, those are the thinkers versus the feelers, right? And as you said, about 50-50 people that want the emotion first, but then they actually do want some facts before they make a decision. And people who want the facts first, but then they're going to choose based on emotion, just like most other people. So it's how we tell the story and how we engage the audience that then we can say these two things fit together and, and tell a story that matters to them. And someone else was saying, you know, what examples of rewards? And then Ruth so excellently shared some examples of, of rewards in terms of vouchers for activities. So if you're giving people, you know, a $5 gift certificate to Starbucks for referrals, why not do that? Because they've got 10 points towards their job search. I love it. And you could do that with an app. You could also do it with just a simple spreadsheet. And, and, you know, and emails, it, you wouldn't have to make technology get in the way of gamifying the process with your clients. If they do three networking, they get three points. And when they get 10 points, they get a $10 gift certificate towards whatever they want, right? You, I be careful about giving everybody coffee. I don't drink coffee. Everybody gives me Starbucks cards and I give them to my nanny who loves them. So thinking about what really matters for our clients. So I want to thank you for attending and invite you to attend our events like this. We have at least five or six free events every year. Our annual white paper release. We do two a year on personal branding trends and we do two a year at least on resume profile writing trends. The most recent things that we have coming up starting in April, we have our social branding class where we teach you how to create a social branding coaching program 
help your clients decide what platforms they should be on based on their audience, not just what they think and feel. And we'd look forward to having you in that. So join us for our, our free programs. Join us to network. Join us to share with other professionals. And I look forward to seeing so many of you here in less than two weeks in the beautiful beach of San Diego. And, and hopefully we'll see some more of you also on the East Coast. We'll be on the East Coast for our in-person conference in 2020. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, you'll get the recording. You'll get a link where you can submit your name for a certificate. Thank you, Louise, for sharing your insight. Thank you, Ruth, for sharing your insights. And those of you who are sharing in the chat, thank you so much for doing that as well. I will keep you in the loop. If you want to stay in the loop, you can always join our newsletter. And um, we'll see you again next time when we're here at Career Thought Leaders. If you want to connect with me, you can always email me at Marie, M-A-R-I-E, at careerthoughtleaders.com. Thank you all for your participation. And to all of our Career Jam facilitators and participants, thank you for sharing all of your wisdom.